So today's video is day number four of 10 days of terror on my channel. If you are new around here, every single day for 10 days, up until Halloween and on Halloween, I am uploading a different true crime video every single day. Some of them relating to Halloween, some of them not so much relating to Halloween. And today's video is actually very much related to Halloween, but before I get into that, I just wanna let you know that I've recently enabled channel memberships on my channel. Basically, if you don't know what channel memberships are, there's a little button that says join by my subscriber button or there's a link in the description if you're on a different device and you basically get access to a bunch of extra perks on my channel. When you comment on my videos you'll get my little channel picture next to your name so that I and everyone else knows you're a channel member. We can talk in the comments with our little matching pictures. You'll also get access to members only community posts where we can talk about the cases I'm covering. You can suggest cases. I'm going to be doing polls on my members only community tab so you guys get to vote which cases you see first. And the final perk is at the end of every single one of my videos and this will start on Sunday because tomorrow's video and Saturday's video are also pre-filmed. So starting on Sunday's video, all of my channel members' names will be put onto an end card and put at the end of my video just as a thank you. Of course you can let me know if you don't want to be on that end card or if you want a different name on that end card. If you don't want it to be your actual name, you can give me a nickname or whatever, that's totally fine. But I just kind of wanted a way to bring you guys literally into the videos, have you guys be an actual part of the videos. So I thought that was a cute little idea. But of course, if you don't want to become a member, that is completely fine. These are just extra little perks. Everything else is gonna stay the same on my channel. It's just, if you do want to support me and my content that little bit more, you do get some extra perks as a thank you for it. So yeah, like I said, the link's in the description if you wanna go and check it out and read up on the perks and things like that and I'll be posting in the community tab tonight after this video and the end screen thing will start on Sunday. Anyway, all that being said, today's video is on the Candyman, also known as the man that killed Halloween. I know there's a bunch of different criminals, especially serial killers nicknamed the Candyman. This one is not a serial killer, this is a one-off murder case. And it does get quite confusing because so many of you guys recommend that I cover the Candyman, but there's literally about 50 criminals nicknamed the Candyman. So I'm looking at them all, I'm going to get through them all hopefully. But today we're going to be talking about the man that killed Halloween, also known as the Candyman. But quickly before I get into this video I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This is all just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So the O'Brien family lived in Deer Park in Texas. It consisted of Father Ronald, Mother Diane and the children were 8 year old Timothy and 5 year old Elizabeth. On Halloween of 1974, Ronald and the neighbour decided that they were going to take their kids out trick-or-treating together as a group. So the kids dressed up and they went out trick-or-treating and everything went well for the first few houses when they ended up at one where the occupant didn't answer the door. And the kids got impatient realising that they weren't going to get any sweets from this house and so they ran ahead to the next one and the neighbour followed them although Ronald O'Brien stayed back at this house. A couple of minutes later, Ronald rejoined the group saying that the person at the house did eventually answer the door and he gave him five sherbet sticks for the kids. So he gave one to each of the three kids, his own son, his own daughter, the neighbour's child, and he also gave another one to the neighbour for his other child who was younger and waiting at home. And then he gave the last of the five sherbet sticks to a random boy walking past that he recognised from church. So the group carried on trick-or-treating, although they were out for much longer after that, they only did two streets because it was actually raining quite bad. So they finished up trick-or-treating, they went home and then eight-year-old Timothy decided that he wanted some of his Halloween sweets that he just collected and so he chose the sherbet stick that his dad got from that house. But this sherbet stick was quite hard to open, it had a staple over the top of it and so Timothy gave it to his dad Ronald who opened it for him and then give him it back so we could eat it. Timothy only had like a small mouthful of this sherbet and then complained that it was bitter. He said it really didn't taste nice and so he left the rest of it. So Ronald, his dad made him some Kool-Aid so that he could wash this taste out of his mouth but then Timothy started complaining of really painful stomach ache. Within minutes of eating the sherbet, Timothy ran to the bathroom, began projectile vomiting and convulsing on the floor. So Ronald ran in and held Timothy as he was vomiting and claimed that his son went limp in his arms. So when I'm 
ambulance was called because this was clearly an emergency. However, on his way to the hospital, Timothy O'Brien passed away less than half an hour after eating the sweets. So quickly, news spread about the neighbourhood that there was one house giving out poisoned sweets to children and everyone was suspicious of all of their neighbours. Many of the parents in the neighbourhood were confiscating their children's sweets, fearing that maybe they'd been to this house that was giving out poisoned sweets. Police were given thousands and thousands of sweets to either test or destroy out of fears that they might be poisoned. So police began questioning Timothy's family, specifically his dad who was out trick-or-treating with his son that night and they found that the poison sweet was actually the sherbet and so an alert was put out in the neighbourhood. Ronald told police how this house had given him five sherbet sticks and luckily none of the other four children had eaten them yet so they were confiscated as well. Obviously it was easy to get the first three sherbet sticks back, one of them was Ronald's other child and both of the other two were the neighbour's children so it was easy to get those. However that fifth sherbet stick Ronald gave to a random boy on the street that he recognised from church so it was going to be harder to locate that one. Police eventually the next morning got in contact with the fifth boy's parents and they frantically began searching through his trick-or-treat bag trying to find a sherbet stick. But they couldn't find this sherbet stick anywhere. They were panicking, they were frantic and so they ran up to their son's room fearing that maybe it might be too late. And there in his bed was this boy asleep with the uneaten sherbet stick in his hand. He said he was going to eat it before he had his nap, however the staple on the top was just too hard for him to open and so he didn't bother eating it luckily. So police studied these sherbet sticks and found that the first two inches of sherbet had been poured out and replaced with cyanide powder. And the amount of cyanide in these sticks was enough to kill between three and four fully grown adults and these were given to children under the age of 10. So obviously police questioned Ronald O'Brien about like which house he got it from, what the person at the house looked like but he couldn't remember the house that he got it from. Which police found a bit odd because like I said they only went to like two houses trick-or-treating because it was raining so he'd probably only been to like 40 or 50 houses. So police just went out and questioned every single house that the group went to that night trick-or-treating, yet none of them said they were giving out sherbet sticks. Eventually, Ronald did remember the house that gave him the sherbet sticks. However, he said that the person that answered the door just kind of cracked open the door a little bit, didn't even turn on a light inside and just put his hand out with the sherbet sticks in his hand so Ronald didn't see who gave him them. The owner of this house was a man named Courtney Melvin who was an air traffic controller who claimed that he was at work until 11pm that night. So police went and questioned almost 200 people that Courtney Melvin worked with at the airport and every single one of them said that he was in that night. So now that Courtney Melvin was ruled out as a suspect, police began to wonder why Ronald had said that he got the sweets from that house when he obviously didn't. So they began looking into Ronald O'Brien, Timothy's own father. Police quickly realised that Ronald O'Brien was in $100,000 of debt and he jumped around from job to job like every couple of months. He never had like a stable career. Money was always a problem for Ronald. At the time of Timothy's death, Ronald was also being suspected of theft at his workplace as an optician and he was very close to being fired from that job as well. His car was about to be repossessed, he'd taken out several different bank loans which the family home was actually foreclosed on, meaning that he was probably going to lose the family home as well. So the police dug a little bit further and found that Ronald O'Brien had actually taken out life insurance policies on both of his children just a couple of months earlier. In January he originally took out $10,000 plans on each of his children and then just a month before Timothy's death he upped it by a further $20,000 per child. And then in the days before Halloween, in the days before Timothy's murder, he took out a further $20,000 per child making their total life insurance policies when rounded up around 60,000 per child which is a ridiculously high life insurance policy for a five-year-old and an eight-year-old especially when you're having money problems as it is. So police went and spoke to Diane, Ronald's wife, the children's mother, who said she actually had no idea that the children had any life insurance policies, never mind $60,000 ones. And when police got in contact with the life insurance companies, they told them that Ronald O'Brien had actually contacted them on the 1st of November, the morning after his son died, inquiring about how he could get the money from his life insurance policy. So obviously, especially in the beginning, this case was all over the news. A child had been murdered 
via Halloween sweets. Someone had poisoned Halloween sweets with the intention of killing a child. And when they heard about this news, a local chemical supply store decided to get in contact with police because they believed that Ronald O'Brien had actually tried to buy cyanide from their shop. Due to its lethality, the chemical supply store will only sell cyanide in very, very small amounts unless you have some kind of license or whatever because it is so dangerous, they don't want to just give large amounts of it to anyone, obviously. And this man that came into their store that they believed was Ronald O'Brien asked for a huge amount, way more than they could give him. And when they said no, he left without buying anything. So police quickly theorised that Ronald O'Brien had tried to poison both of his children, tried to kill both of his children, in an attempt to get their life insurance money and get himself out of debt. And they believe that he probably gave the other laced sweets to other kids just to kind of cover his own tracks so that it wasn't just his kids being targeted. If it seemed to be multiple children that died from these laced sweets, then it was obvious that it was probably a house giving out these sweets. So police accused and questioned Ronald O'Brien in the following days, yet he maintained his innocence. He did not kill his children but police didn't believe him and so they arrested him on November 5th. He was charged with one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder, making him eligible for the death penalty. Ronald pled not guilty to all five charges, yet the prosecution had a ton of evidence against him. Ronald's friend, who also happened to be a chemist, was called up to testify and he said that a year before this, Ronald had questioned him about cyanide all summer. He was asking him where he could get cyanide, what the lethal dose was, how it killed people and eventually this friend who was a chemist just kind of cut him off because he was getting very strange. The salesman in that chemical supply store testified to say that it was in fact Ronald O'Brien that came into his shop just a week before Timothy's murder trying to buy cyanide. Ronald's friends and co-workers all testified to say that Ronald had a weird interest in cyanide. He always seemed to be talking about cyanide particularly in the couple of months before Timothy's murder. Ronald's brother-in-law and sister-in-law both testified that at Timothy's funeral, at his eight-year-old son's funeral, Ronald would not shut up about how much money he was going to get from this life insurance policy. Instead of grieving over his recently deceased eight-year-old son, he was telling everyone what he was going to spend the life insurance money on, including a trip away. On June 3rd, 1975, the jury took just 45 minutes to decide that Ronald O'Brien was guilty of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. They then took a further 70 minutes to decide that Ronald O'Brien should be sentenced to death. After he was found guilty, his wife Diane divorced him and years later she eventually found another man, she remarried and this man adopted her daughter Elizabeth and they kind of rebuilt their family as much as they could without Timothy. Ronald spent 10 years in prison before his execution, the whole time he was being relentlessly attacked and harassed by other inmates for being a child killer. So Ronald O'Brien's initial execution date was set for August 8th, 1980, six years after the murder. However, his attorney got it postponed. So a new date was set for two years later on May 25th, 1982, but once again, his attorney got it postponed for unknown reasons. So a third date was set for the eighth anniversary of the murder, Halloween of 1982, and this time the judge said that he would drive Ronald O'Brien to the death chamber himself if it meant that he finally got his execution. But once again, the Supreme Court delayed Ronald O'Brien's execution date, giving him chance to appeal his death penalty. And Ronald's appeal was unsuccessful, and so a fourth execution date was set for March 31st of 1984. And once again, Ronald's attorney tried to postpone this date, but this time, by saying that the lethal injection was too cruel of a punishment. But this time, finally, judges rejected the attorney's request to postpone the execution and Ronald O'Brien was killed by lethal injection. In his final statement, Ronald O'Brien professed his innocence and said that he felt that the death penalty was wrong. And during the execution, a crowd of 300 people gathered outside, all cheering, some of them even shouting trick or treat, some of them throwing sweets in the air, and yeah, that completes this case. This one was very heavy, but I couldn't not cover this case with it being so related to Halloween. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a big thumbs up and subscribe down below if you want to see some more from me. Like
like I said, for the next, I think there's about a week of it left, I am going to be uploading true crime videos every single day on this channel. So if you do want to be a part of that, make sure you subscribe, make sure you've got my notifications on, just click the bell and you get to know every single time I upload. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. Thank you so, so much if you do become a member of my channel, since this is the first time I'm mentioning it, I just want to say thank you if you have already become a member or if you do in the future. It does really help me out and it does make me so happy just to know that you guys like my content that much and that you want little extra bits and you want to support me. It makes my heart so happy. But yeah, like I said, don't worry if you don't want to be a channel member. That is completely fine. All the content will stay exactly the same. You just won't get those little extras like I mentioned. But everything else will be staying the same. All my uploads you'll get everything as normal, no worries. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye!